good afternoon. It's been a long conference, a lot of great messages on various topics, all dealing with this subject. Current trends in light of the last days, pointing people to the scriptures, to the word of God. Conferences like these, these days, are rather rare. We are living in the days which the Bible foretold. It seems that many who were once interested in Bible prophecy and the return of Jesus Christ have been diverted. Jesus said to beware, because rather than being alert, there would be many that are asleep. But we've known this in advance because the scriptures have told us beforehand. I commend each of you that have come to this conference. And I pray that uh, you will leave differently than you've come uh, because you've heard from God through his word, illuminated by his spirit. My final topic will deal with the subject that we've been discussing, that is faith undone. This is part four, and I have subtitled this presentation, Proclaiming the Gospel in the Midst of Last Day's Apostasy. And I would like to finish my portion of this conference on a positive note. I'm thankful for the different presentations that have been dispersed throughout this conference that have been constantly pointing us towards the gospel, the light of the gospel, the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ that sets sinners free. Faith Undone was published in August, and from that point on, my life has been rather different. I won't go into the details, but essentially when you enter into confrontational kind of ministry, you can expect there to be opposition. You remember when Paul was called on the road to Damascus, and Jesus said to him, I've called you to be a minister and a witness, and I will deliver you. Jews from the Gentiles, I will deliver you from the opposition that you will face. He had plenty of opposition. In fact, he once said, a great door for effectual service has opened to me. But there are many adversaries. And that's what we should expect. What is happening here today in terms of attempting to communicate this message on a broader scale through the internet shouldn't be a surprise. But we know that our God is victorious and that we read in the scriptures what will occur in the end. And that is the theme of my message today, is not defeat, but victory, and that the gospel of Jesus Christ will be proclaimed and the church of Jesus Christ will be established as it has been throughout the ages, in spite of the opposition that has occurred. And so for my text, I use Matthew 16, verses 13 to 18. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee. But my Father which is in heaven, and I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Upon this rock, 
What was Jesus referring to? It's very clear. Jesus Christ is the foundation. He's the cornerstone of the church. Although there are those who say, no, no, that isn't it at all. You see, Jesus was speaking to Peter, and he said, upon you, Peter, upon this little rock, I will build my church. Would Jesus Christ build his church upon the leadership of a man? That's what we've been talking about in this conference. Trusting in man and man's methods leads to destruction. We are to trust in Jesus Christ and his word alone. And then a little later, in the same context, Jesus looks to Peter and he says, Get behind me, Satan. So if he was placing his trust in Peter to establish the church, he was putting his trust in a man who was controlled by Satan. We're all subject to Satan's ideas and inspiration through the flesh. In no way could the church be placed in trust into any man or any method or any movement. Jesus Christ is the cornerstone. Jesus Christ is the creator. He's the redeemer. The gospel is God's sovereign plan to save man. This is the gospel that we find in the scriptures. As Paul has said repeatedly, the gospel according to the scriptures. God's adversary, Satan, hates the gospel. He wants to do everything he can to destroy people, to cause people to doubt to believe in the gospel, or to confuse them to believe that they believe, but instead have been deceived. But we know, according to the words of Jesus, that the church that Jesus Christ established, will be triumphant. It's in the Word of God. Now, in spite of this, we know there will be tremendous deception. We have gone over these scriptures previously. Deception in the last days, 2 Thessalonians 2, 3 to 11, this time of apostasy, which will be a preparation for the revelation of a man proclaiming his divinity, when someday a man will stand up, he'll be in the temple in Jerusalem. A religious system will have been established. It will have been established a global religious system for the cause of peace. It will be in the name of Christ, very likely headquarters in Rome. A religious system that's brought together by a religious entity, spiritual entity known as the Queen, the Queen of Heaven. Why do I say this? Well, throughout history, since the time of Babylon, there has been a female deity who has played a role in deceiving the nations. In Jeremiah, in chapter 7, it's evident, is given the name the Queen of Heaven, but that wasn't the first time that this entity had appeared in history. Throughout the ages, a female deity, fallen spiritual being, had misled many nations, including the children of Israel, and God warned the children of Israel. It was an abomination. This session was titled, The Queen of Heaven, or Messages from Heaven. I was going to deal with that subject in detail, explaining how all religions are coming together under unification by so-called messages from a woman claiming to be the mother of Jesus. By the way, as I understand it, in this auditorium, on an annual basis, they have a gathering for this purpose, to honor Our Lady. There's nothing wrong with honoring Mary, the mother of Jesus, according to the Scriptures. But as you know, the parameters for Mary, the mother of Jesus, have been expanded beyond biblical parameters to the point that people are worshiping a woman claiming to be the mother of Jesus in no way is the mother of Jesus. And she plays a role in bringing about the one world religion as we're going to see in the next few years. This kind of deception, lying signs and wonders, is what Paul is talking about in 2 Thessalonians. It prepares the way for someday for a man to say, I'm God, I'm the king, I don't need the queen and her system. And he sets up his throne and says, I'm king of the world, but he's a man, but this man is embodied by Satan, and we're referring, of course, to the Antichrist. You know that today, in most evangelical circles, when you talk 
this way they think you're from another planet. But it's in the Bible. And the delusion is underway. It's not something to look forward to. It's here. It's happening. It's before us. And the reason, of course, is because of doctrines of demons. But this, again, is not new. Throughout the ages, the fallen spiritual dimension has done everything they can to deceive mankind. Since the fall of man in the Garden of Eden, our planet has been the battleground of the universe. And so it continues. And we are part of that battle against an unseen dimension. 2 Timothy 3, 1-5, describing in general the kinds of thinking and behavior of those who have believed. Paul writes, This know also in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those who are good, belovers of their own selves. Covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures, more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. It describes our generation perfectly. Rather than lovers of God, lovers of themselves, they will be psychologized. They will be explaining away sin human behavior in man's perspective rather than in light of God's revelation. And that's exactly where we are. In 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 1 to 6, with regards to the peace plan that will take place, which is not God's plan, it's Satan's plan. And in this context, it says, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains as a pregnant woman. Very apt illustration. We all know what a woman goes through before she gives birth. I was reminded of that this past June. My daughter, Angela, presented our first grandchild. What a blessing. But I happened to be home at that period of time and not traveling when we received the call about 5 o'clock in the afternoon of June 18th. It was Angela, and she said, uh, Dad, tell Mom that I, I'm going to go into the hospital. I said, do you want your mom and I to come? Oh, no, no, everything's fine. Well, my wife is an obstetrics nurse. She has been practicing as an industrial nurse for the last 20 or so years, but that was her training. So we waited patiently, and it was about 8 o'clock at night, another call. It was Angela, Dad, Dad, can Mom come? Can Mom come? And so we went to the hospital. And uh, my wife and I sat with Angela for several hours, and I, I experienced uh, observing my daughter going through labor. I'd kind of forgotten what it was like with my wife. I think I was in greater distress than she as I was watching. And then the time came, and you know, I was asked to leave the room, and I went down the hall into a waiting room. And as I sat there, I heard these screams and yelling and it was a lady down the hall, it wasn't my daughter, but I thought for sure it must be she going through this. And I, to be honest with you, I was in a terrible state. And then I received the message, you can come in. Labor. You know what it's like. Intense pain. And those pains become closer together as the birth approaches, and more intense, and that's the way it is. That's how the end times unfolds, and the pains, and the intensity of the pains in the last several years is exactly like that. But do you know what? The vast majority of those who profess to be Bible-believing Christians don't even know that anything's going on. They're asleep. And they should be awake. Second Timothy 3, But men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing whom thou hast learned them. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Jesus or Christ Jesus. You see, this is the only answer at this particular time in history. It's to know the Scriptures. Isn't it any wonder, then, that the vast majority of churches no longer teach the Scriptures 
Or they use books like the message that hide the Scriptures or given another interpretation of the Scriptures. The Word of God is under attack. And the end times is unfolding. And the light of the Word that would be so important is being hidden away. Although there are those that are the remnant who stand for the truth, who are proclaiming the truth in the midst of the darkness, and they are making a difference. So no wonder Jesus would ask the question, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? That's the way it will be. 2 Peter 3, 2 and 4, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before the holy prophets and of the commandment of the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. And if there is one thing that I could point to that has caused more people to doubt Bible prophecy and the authenticity of the Bible and the inerrancy of the Word of God, it's the idea of uniformitarianism, which is the foundation of Darwinian evolution, which has caused people to reject the Genesis record. And I challenge any pastor that's listening or here today that's in the purpose-driven emerging church movement, do you teach the Genesis record as the Word of God? Or do you call it an allegory or a mythology? Because if you do, you've rejected the Word of God from the beginning and it will continue on the way through. And no wonder you're embracing people's books rather than the book, the Bible, which is our authority, which is the truth. We need to get back to God's word and we need to get back at the beginning where it says in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth and believe it, for the creator is the redeemer. Now I said I wanted to finish on a positive note, but I have some other things to say that I will. I want to share with you a few more warning signs of the dangers of the times. First of all, I show you a picture of Bishop Hansen, head of the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America. I believe there's one just around the corner. At a conference a couple of years ago in Florida, a news article reported, the leader of the nation's largest Lutheran denomination has called for a global Christian council to address an identity crisis on how churches interpret and understand the Bible. Presiding Bishop Mark Hansen of the Evangelical Church in America called for Catholics Eastern Orthodox, Anglican, and Lutheran churches to come together to combat a fundamentalist, millennialist, apocalypticist reading of the Scripture. He wanted to form a committee of Catholics, Lutherans, Anglicans, and Orthodox to monitor people who, well, as he called them, they were fundamentalist, millennialist, apocalypticist. By the way, that would include every speaker at this conference. Are they dangerous people? According to him, yes. Oh, by the way, his plan is to have Eucharistic union with Rome by 2017, the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. So you see, this is the message that's being sent out. Israel is not Israel. That's why they attack those who believe that Israel is Israel. They don't believe in apocalyptic future or a millennium. And those of us who do, based on the scriptures, we are the dangerous fundamentalists who must be suppressed. You see, the whole plan these days is to establish the kingdom, kingdom now, here on planet Earth, through a social plan. Rick Warren, in an interview with Charlie Rose, August 17th, I quote, he said, at the beginning of the 20th century, a lot of mainline churches said there isn't a, a need so much for personal salvation as much as a need for social salvation. And we can redeem these structures, and then we'll have hope because people are basically good. Now, I've been told that that's exactly the way it was at the beginning of the 20th century. A great split in evangelical Christianity between those who believed that heaven could be here on earth through a social program versus those who believed that heaven was in heaven and the only way you could get there is through Jesus Christ alone. So there was a split. But now there's another split coming. He says, well, then other people which are the fundamentalists and evangelicals said, now we're going to focus on Jesus, our Savior. 
They tended to focus on family issues, personal issues. They defined morality in terms of personal morality, not in terms of public morality. Well, who's right? Warren asks. They both are. The fact is, they both are, and they need to be brought together. Now, let me ask you a question. This group of Christians, so-called, which believe that heaven is here on earth through social effort, could we, they get together with those who believe that heaven can only be a place to go through the blood of Jesus Christ? They don't even believe in the blood of Jesus Christ. They don't even believe in the fact that he's resurrected from the dead. They don't believe that he was born of a virgin. Can we get together? If we get together, then I would say that the side that was once Bible-believing would move to the middle and meet those that were liberal. And that's the direction that is going. A book entitled Emerging Churches, Gibson Bolger, right, page 131, Christians cannot truly evangelize unless they're prepared to be evangelized in the process. What? Well, that's the general consensus of the emerging church. From the same book, uh, they quote Spencer Burke, a pastor who's in Newport Beach, head of a website called Ooze.com. He says, the Christian tradition could hold to an inclusive model, not an exclusive one. We have a community hermeneutic. We read other sacred writings, then get back to the scripture and decide together how to interpret what we've read from the literature that other religions hold sacred. You heard Carl in the previous session. You go to these large meetings, worldwide, global religion, and that's what they're talking about. But now it's so-called Christians that are talking about the same thing. It continues. Now, quoting again from the book, Burke's community is prepared to learn from faith traditions outside the Christian fold. There's a Buddhist family in their church. As a community, the church visited a Buddhist temple. They participated in a guided meditation with this family. Burke celebrates the many ways God is revealed. He recognizes the Spirit has been with these people all along. The community celebrates other traditions. They reach out to other traditions and they see them as beloved children of God with a focus on kingdom rather than on church. People find their relationship with other faiths changes. And you see, this is the idea. This is the motive. We're just going to take the kingdom out to the community. Unfortunately, the world comes into the church and the various belief systems, as can be demonstrated by the fact that so-called Christians are practicing contemplative prayer incorporating Buddhism and Hinduism as a means of getting closer to Jesus. What Jesus? It is not the Jesus of the Bible. Samer Salmanovic, in his contribution to the book An Emergent Manifesto, states, page 192, the emerging church movement has come to believe that the ultimate context of the spiritual aspirations of a follower of Jesus Christ is not Christianity, but rather the kingdom of God. We're not following Jesus? No, no, we're going to establish the kingdom of God and we will work together with other belief systems to do it, they say. Continuing page 194, is our religion, that is Christianity, the only one that understands the true meaning of life? Or does God place his truth in others too? Well, God decides and not us. The gospel is not our gospel. But the gospel of the kingdom of God and what belongs to the kingdom of God cannot be hijacked by Christianity. This is an abomination in the name of Christ. And published by mainstream publishers that are promoting emergent church ideas. And when people take a position and stand against it, you're considered to be narrow-minded, religious bigots. They're trying to hold Christianity into the dark ages. Even within the fellowship that I belong. You see, the opposition is not coming from the world, it's coming from within the church. We say Christianity must be changed, it must be reinvented. We must be more open to what others believe. Rick Warren in Forbes magazine said the church in all its expressions, Catholic, Evangelical, Pentecostal, Protestant, and many others, has 2.3 billion followers. 2.3 billion followers of what? Followers of Jesus Christ and his word? People who have had born-again experiences? I doubt it very much. The 
terminology for the church is being redefined. In fact, we see ambassadors for this faith system. Well, for example, like this photograph here of Rick Warren in Jordan. You see, it's important to reach out to others in other belief systems. But to endorse what they're doing and saying just so you can work together for a common cause to do good, that is not the gospel. The gospel is recognizing who we are and what we've done, sinners separated from God because of sin, and acknowledging him, who he is and what he's done, and asking for forgiveness. And you can't work together with others with this disguise, oh, maybe I'll slip in the gospel sometime in the future. The preaching of the cross to those that are perishing is foolishness. It will always be foolishness, but the gospel is the power of God. And Paul said he wasn't ashamed of it, and so why should we be ashamed of the gospel? You see, those who resist this movement are called resistors. Maybe you're one. You've been told that, and you need to leave your church. Well, I would suggest that you do. Pastor Rick Warren, pastor of Saddleback, member of the Council of Foreign Relations, who he clearly states himself in a transcript, Can't We Just All Get Along, posted on YouTube February 14th at a discussion at uh, Davos in which uh, Tony Blair was the host said, I applaud Davos for having this session. I applaud you for coming to it. It really says more about you than it does about me or us. If you are a global business leader, you need to understand the future of the world is not secularism, it is religious pluralism. You may not like that, but you're going to have to deal with it. Religious pluralism. That fits into the plan, the three-legged stool plan. And as Brian McLaren has said, we are emerging into a new era of Christian faith as a living color, global community. It is immediately clear this kind of emergence must lead to convergence, a kind of relationship that has never before existed. And finally, one more thing from Faith Undone, chapter 11. It's called Slaughterhouse Religion. And I want to get to the point what the emerging church is all about. It's an attack against the very heart and core of Bible-believing Christianity, against the belief in who Jesus is, and that his blood was shed upon the cross at Calvary, and the sacrifice was made. You see, those in the emerging church call this the slaughterhouse religion. And McLaren and others have made it clear that it's dangerous McLaren, as we quoted the book, says, the cross isn't the center of Christianity. The cross is a distraction. It's false advertising for God. Really. Or then we quote Alan Jones in his book, Reimagining, who says, the church's fixation on the death of Jesus as a universal saving act must end. And the place of the cross must be reimagined in Christian faith. Brian McLaren endorses his book. So that's where it's going. And if you're a Bible-believing Christian today and you're hearing these things, if you're not upset, you should be. But churches by the thousands everywhere, every denomination are moving in this direction. Oh, we need to change Christianity in order to be able to reach the postmodern generation. With what? Not the truth, but to be part of the deception. Now, I want to get to the heart of this message. Do you recall when God warned Israel? The prophets of old were called to speak the truth to those that were deceived. Ezekiel 3, 17-19, Son of man, I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore hear the word at my mouth and give them warning from me. When I say unto the wicked, Thou shalt surely die, and thou givest them not warning, nor speakest to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life, the same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. Yet if thou warn the wicked, and the turn not from his wickedness, nor from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. Yes, that was for Ezekiel to his time, Old Testament, we live in the day of grace, but the principle is the same. If you... Know the truth, you cannot be silent. 
you must tell others. Jeremiah, called by God to give a warning, chapter 23, 1-3, Woe be unto the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, saith the Lord. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God of Israel against the pastors that I feed my people. You have scattered my flock, driven them away. Isn't that interesting? Shepherds lead. The Holy Spirit leads us. The Good Shepherd, Jesus Christ, will lead us. And those who are placed in position of pastors and shepherds are to lead because they're following the chief shepherd. But they're not. They're following some man and his method in the movement. And they're not leading the sheep. They're driving the sheep. The sheep are being driven away. The flock is being scattered. I will visit upon you the evil of your doing, saith the Lord. I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries, whither I have driven them, will bring them again to the folds, and they shall be fruitful and increase. But they hated Jeremiah's message. Jeremiah 23, 16, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Hearken not unto the words of the prophets, and prophesy unto you, they make you vain. They speak a vision of their own heart and not out of the mouth of the Lord. They say still unto them that despise me, the Lord hath said that he shall have, we shall have peace. And they say unto everyone that walketh after the imagination of his own heart, no evil shall come upon you, exactly like today. For who hath stood in the counsel of the Lord and hath perceived and heard his word? Who hath marked his word and heard it? Behold, a whirlwind of the Lord is gone forth in fury, even a glorious, grievous whirlwind. It shall fall grievously upon the head of the wicked. The anger of the Lord shall not return until he have ex executed, until he have performed the thoughts of his heart in the latter days. Ye shall consider it perfectly, or ye shall understand it. It should speak to our hearts. As I said, Jeremiah was not received. They said, come and let us devise devices against Jeremiah. For the law shall not perish from the priest, nor counsel from the wise, nor the word from the prophet. Come and let us smite him with the tongue. Let us not give heed to any of his words. Let's get rid of him. Let's get rid of his message. Let's shut down the internet. Let's take him off radio. Let's start false rumors. Whatever we can do, let's get rid of the messenger. But the message that the messenger proclaimed was from the God, the Word of God. And I ask you, is God warning the church in the same way today? By His Word. If there are warnings in His Word that were relevant in Jeremiah's day, and the problems that we face are the same kinds of problems that people have turned away from God and his word to the gods, then isn't the same message that Jeremiah and others proclaimed in the past relevant for our generation? Has God changed? I don't believe so. But the question is, is there hope for the church? Do you remember what Jesus said? Upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. You see, we have this false conception today that the church means growth, large numbers, the more, the more successful, but not in God's economy. The church must be based on a solid foundation, which is Jesus Christ. No other foundation. And it's upon this rock that the church will be built, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, and God will bring it about, not man. Because the scriptures are full of representations that our God is sovereign, Daniel 4, 35, and all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. And he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand or say unto him, What doest thou? 
Isaiah 46, 9 and 10, Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times of things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. You see, Satan and all those that follow him can do everything they want to try to destroy God and his plan for man, but they will not be successful because the church of Jesus Christ will triumph. It will be established as it has been through the generations. Psalm twenty-two, twenty-eight: For the kingdom is the Lord's and he is the governor among the nations. Jesus made it clear that it was a narrow way. There would be few that would be on the path, Matthew 7, 13 and 14. And there would be a wide pathway. Many would be on that path headed towards destruction. That is exactly what we see, what we would expect. Jesus made it clear that the only way to spend eternity with him is through him alone. He said, I'm the way, the truth, the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. It is not true to say that all religions pray to the same God. It is not true. That is the case. And yet leaders of our nation are making these claims. But it is anti-biblical. It is going against the God of the Bible to say such things. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. Paul writes, For by grace are you saved through faith, and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God not of works, lest any man should boast. Is it possible to earn your salvation? No. It is by grace. It's by faith in believing in Jesus alone, not by works, that any man should boast. So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. That is the foundation of the Christian faith. And so the Word of God, as you can understand, is very, very important. No wonder there is attack against it in these days. Paul said these words, which each one of us should be able to repeat. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation, to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. And what is so important and what is the heart and core of our Christian faith is the cross. Paul, writing to the church at Corinth, said, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. Now take a moment and think. Was there a time in your life when this truth became clear to your understanding? I can think of the exact moment. For several months I was on a journey searching for truth. I was 30 years old, I had spent time, my mind was actually being reprogrammed. I had spent many years of my life as a strong promoter of the Darwinian view. I, I had rejected the Bible, but God, by his grace, met me on the road of life. And I started to rethink what I had believed, what I was teaching others, and I came to the realization that I was wrong. Oh God, what have I done? What can I do? I tried desperately for weeks to please God based on my efforts. Each morning I'd get up and I'd pray, Oh God, what can I do? Help me to be a better person today so you will accept me. And I discovered each night when I went to bed I had failed horribly. And one night in my own living room, in desperation, I cried out, God, what have you done or what will you do so I can have peace? And a verse popped into my remembrance. I had memorized that verse many times as a child, and suddenly it became so clear in my thinking, I remembered where I could find the verse because my dad had written it in the front of my Bible, and I went to the shelf and I pulled the Bible down. It had been given to me when I was nine years old by my parents, and I, 
opened to the front, and I read in my dad's handwriting, John chapter 3, verse 16. And it was at that moment in my life that I came to the realization that I discovered the truth, the truth that would set me free. And I came to the realization who the Creator is, Jesus Christ. For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him alone should not perish but have everlasting life. The preaching of the cross to those that are foolishness, or to those that are perishing is foolishness, but to those that are saved it is the power of God. Sometime in your life that has become real to you. Or if it hasn't, you're on the wrong path. You see, we are in the last days scenario. The Bible refers to a counterfeit bride that will be prepared, setting up a global religion. It's the harlot. And eventually that religion is done away with by the man who proclaims his divinity. The queen of heaven, I believe, sets up this religion, bringing all religions together for the cause of peace in the name of Christ. And when that system is set up three and a half years into the tribulation, the man will say, we don't need the queen, I'm the king, king of the world. And yes, he's the man, but he is a man, but he's embodied by Satan. It's just down the road. If this is true according to the scriptures, then we would expect there would be a time of preparation that would occur and there would be a falling away. Those who once believed and trusted in the scriptures would be led away and deceived. Is it happening? The apostasy, which the Bible foretells, is here. It can be proven. Many denominations, pastors who are well known for teaching the word, now that they're older and no longer in the pulpits, have been replaced by people from seminaries that no longer teach the Bible, no longer believe in the end times, no longer believe in the Genesis record. Oh, they claim that they are evangelical, they're reaching out to bring more and more people into Christianity, but they're leading people away from true Christianity, and they're forming the basis to establish the third leg of the three-legged stool. There's more and more pressure on pastors to conform to this new reformation. It will continue to increase. Fewer pastors are watching over their flocks. They're scoffing, they're rejecting those who are warning people about the dangers that's taking place. They're warning their sheep, don't go to conferences like this one here held this week. You see, we are in the last days. And the last days, church, is being established. Jesus said, upon this rock, I will build my church. Find a pastor that teaches the word of God and support him. Some are saying it's more and more difficult all the time. I know there are several in this community, but a few. It's the same everywhere. In every country. Fewer and fewer pastors are teaching the Bible, teaching the word. Find one that does and support him. Or at least find some teaching that's available, perhaps pastors that broadcast their messages on the internet, or form a church in your own home. 2 Timothy 4, 5, and 8, but watch thou all things endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of the ministry. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I've fought a good fight, I've finished my course, I've kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. These words by Paul written to Timothy. He knew he didn't have long. But he wanted to hand off to Timothy the baton. He said, preach the word. In the last days there will come this time of deception. They will no longer accept doctrine, sound doctrine. They will want their ears tickled. They will want to be told everything is okay. He said, preach the word. Do the work of the evangelist. And look forward for that day of his appearing. But until then, those of us that remain have a job. And that's to tell others. And that's how I want to conclude today. I thank God for the men in my life that have instilled in me certain 
truths and spiritual principles. I think of my dad, not well educated, but one of the wisest men that I have ever met. And I recall how each night he sat in a chair and he pulled out the Bible next to his chair and he read the scriptures. It was his handwriting, his words of his own hand that he had written that God used to reach my life several years after he had gone to heaven. I thank God for men, mentors of mine, you won't know them, but men in Canada who instilled in me the truth of the word of God like Glenn McLean, like Ed Okahara, a Japanese pastor in Hawaii, who instilled in me that humility was where it's at. He said, Christians need to be like a pineapple. I said, I don't understand. He said, have you ever eaten one? I said, yeah. He said, do you understand where the sweetest part of the pineapple is. I said, no, I don't know anything about pineapples. He said, pineapples ripen from the ground up. The sweetest part of the pineapple is the bottom of the pineapple that's closest to the ground. He says, Christians need to be like pineapples. Close to the ground. The closer you are to the ground, the sweeter you will be. I think of men... Like Lauren Pritchard, 87 years old, still teaching the Word of God, teaching Bible prophecy from the Scriptures. And others, some of them in this room, Dave Hunt, Chuck Smith, and men who have instilled in me the grace of God, the truth of His Word. All who love the Word of God and the grace of God. And now I want to conclude with just one final illustration. Jacob talked about farming this morning, and so I thought I would give you the pictures. By the way, I'm a farmer with a call in my life to take the truth, the gospel, to the world. My life's been an adventure. So I'm going to relate to you some things about farming and theology that I think you will remember. I come from the province of Saskatchewan, that's where I grew up. If you see a home in the background there behind the tractor, that's where I grew up as a child. Saskatchewan is much like North Dakota, so I think you will relate. We have dry land farming there, no irrigation, so in the springtime when the conditions are right, we go out with the right equipment and put the seed in the ground. Now this was a few years ago and the implements there were called diskers and well, one of the problems was is that they waste moisture. In Saskatchewan, you need to save all of the moisture you can because if there's no moisture, the seeds don't germinate. So like everywhere else, things change and equipment changes, and so now the seed is put into the ground. It's called air seeders to try to reserve the moisture. But even then, it can be a problem. A few years ago, the seeds were planted and it didn't grow until August, until the first rain. You see, it's sort of like witnessing the gospel we can plant the seeds, we can have the methods and the means to plant the seeds, but the rest is up to the Holy Spirit. And that's the way it is with farming in Saskatchewan. You can plant, but you depend upon conditions that are beyond your control. But if those conditions are sufficient, the plants do grow. Now it's important at this stage that the plant has some stress so the roots can go down into the subsoil. Because if there's continual moisture, the roots remain shallow, and when the winds and the heat comes in July, the crop can wilt in one day, which has happened. In a Christian's life, difficulties and stress and problems help us to put our roots down into spiritual soil. My wife and I have had numerous occasions or opportunities, for example, through the loss of a child, and other things which have occurred even this year. At times feeling defeated. But also recognizing that God is sovereign, that his plan is best for us. When the plants begin to grow, it's in July and they begin to head out. And as the plants head out, you know that harvest is near. The plants begin to change color and well soon you know that it's time to get out the equipment and start cutting the grain well, at least in some cases, that's one of the processes. Windrowing the grain so that it can be picked up by harvesters who have pickups. By the way, 
This is my son, Bryce, driving this combine. He's now with Jesus. This was me last fall helping my son. An older combine, as you can see. My son decided it was time maybe to try to upgrade, and late last fall he tried out this particular implement. You can see it's a different color. It harvests twice the amount the other two combines did together. As you know, at harvest time, there's a limited time, and so farmers must move quickly. The days get shorter and shorter, and we know that as the days get shorter, that winter is on the way. And when winter comes, you know it well here in North Dakota. When the snow comes, you know that you don't have time, you cannot harvest. If it's left to spring, you'll lose the grades. You see, we are in these latter stages of Earth's history. And as believers, we need to do what we can while we can and be most effective as possible, being led by the Holy Spirit. In the past few years, the Lord has impressed upon me to take the gospel message to as many places as possible, even to the darkest places on the planet, through the light of his word. In a few weeks, I'll be returning to my home, where I was grown, brought up. Leaving Southern California, I've been there 20 years, but the time has come to move on. And God has impressed upon me that in this small community where I'm from, by the way, that's where my son, his wife, where my wife and family lived before we went to California, that's the location where my wife and I will live when we return. The community is less than a thousand people. You might wonder, why would you return? Because God is leading me. That hill that you see, just to the east side of the community, beneath it there is a Bible school that I used to teach at, that used to teach the Word. Oh, they still believe they do. But as I understand it, when you reject Genesis as the Word of God, you've doubted the Word of God, and you're open for all kinds of ideas, especially when your school becomes a college and it's based on credentials rather than the truth. God has placed in my heart a vision to go back because on that hill, my mentor, J.S. McLean, and I prayed that God would use our town as a lighthouse to the world. I don't see that it's happening at this moment. But I pray that when we go back, this is our office where we operate, understand the times. And because it is the time for harvest, because it is the time when we should be doing what we can do in order to harvest and to use all the kinds of equipment that we can to be most effective. I pray that God would open the doors to help us to get the information to the world in various ways and various methods. When I return, I'm going to be negotiating for the use of this building, or at least part of it, to establish our headquarters. A 25,000 square foot building, it's a former hospital in town abandoned by the government. And in that location, in this particular wing, we plan to establish studios. These are some of the individuals that have came, come around from the province in Saskatchewan to come, and come around me who have a similar vision. To take global internet television to the world from, well, hopefully from the operating room where you see the light, which I think is significant. For God's word is light. To establish internet television, internet radio, and internet Bible school and headquarters for a humanitarian organization called Bryce Ledge International and others to help children in third world nations, to clothe them, to feed them, to give them education, particularly Christian education, as we're doing right now in Myanmar and the Philippines. Some say it's a grandiose vision. If it's dependent on me and humans, it will be. But if this is God's plan for our lives, it will happen. I pray that in these days, as things get darker and darker, that the light of God's word will shine brighter and brighter. And the gospel of Jesus Christ will be proclaimed, that the light of the word of God will be proclaimed unto the world 
and many others will come to the knowledge of the saving grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. My prayer is that the truth of his word will be proclaimed to the world and the remnant of Jesus Christ will hear, respond, and tell others, Jesus is coming soon. May God bless you.